I read all of the comments on my videos and also I try to respond to a lot of them where I feel a response is expected or appropriate. This is sometimes a bit of a two-edged sword and I want to talk about that a bit today. This video isn't a rant, it isn't going to change the world, and in a way I'm making it partly to crystallise and settle down my own thoughts on these matters, because I find this useful in setting my own future behaviours. So anyway, sometimes when I read the comments, it feels a lot like this. How many of these did you take? And there's an interesting reason for this, which I will discuss using a real-world example. A couple of years ago I made this recipe for stinging nettle soup, and just to answer some questions about that right now, yes it's real, yes it's really delicious and highly nutritious, and no, the nettles don't sting after they're cooked. In the comments on that video, some people wanted to tell me that they noticed I had forgotten to add salt. Most of them were quite polite about it, a few were not. Regardless, they were all wrong. But looking back, here's what happened over a span of time. Initially, I'm just answering, ah, oh, maybe you didn't realise there's quite a bit of salt in the stock cube I added. A week later, after the tenth person has commented that I forgot the salt, I'm just tersely replying, there's salt in the stock cube. And at the end of a month, after 30 people have commented, I'm starting to feel really jaded and frustrated that these idiots keep asking the same question again and again. And I start feeling inclined to be a bit rude. Do you even know what a stock cube is? Except, here's the thing, it isn't a case of idiots asking the same question again and again, it's just a series of individuals all independently asking a question for the first time each, which happens to be the same question. It feels like there's some escalation of stupidity from where I'm sitting. But in reality, there is no reason to believe that the last person to ask is being any more ignorant or innocent than the first. Now that might already seem blindingly obvious to some of you in the cold light of day, but what's happening here isn't logic, it's emotion. It's not cognition, it's feelings. I actually think this is probably quite common in any context where a person receives feedback on a thing over a span of time from different people. Certainly I've seen enough of the symptoms elsewhere to believe that I'm not alone in experiencing this. And I think it's probably a significant factor in that thing where we think that people in the public eye seem to become arrogant, aloof or dismissive. In part, I think they're reacting to their own internal sense of quite literally and with no exaggeration having seen and heard it all before. So what do we do about this? Well. The first step in solving any problem is to acknowledge that the problem exists, and actually I think this might be the only important step. To just remember that this is a simple case that what I may perceive to be a pattern is actually a loose collection of completely independent events. Really, with that kept firmly in mind, everything else should just flow from it. This is a real problem, and I know it has sometimes negatively affected the way I interact with people in the comments on my videos, so if that's been you on the sharp end of my temper in the past, I am genuinely sorry for that. Of course, that doesn't automatically mean that what you said was right. There was, after all, salt in the nettle soup, but there was never so much need for salt in some of my responses. Now, of course, this doesn't mean I have to simply accept abuse, to suffer the insufferable, or to reason with the unreasonable, but I think I do need to remember to exercise a little patience with innocent questions in individual series, especially as I'm a person with idiosyncrasies about can openers and shirts and the like, which will tend to attract such questions. This is just one of a set of related and quite thorny issues in terms of audience interaction, and I know some other YouTubers have solved these issues for themselves by just withdrawing from the comments as their channel grew. I don't want to do that, because I draw a lot of inspiration and ideas and encouragement from the conversations we have in the comments, and also because in general I find the comments on my videos to be an oasis of calm and reason compared to some other parts of the internet, or even other parts of YouTube. Let me know what you think about that in the comments. I promise I'll be polite this time. One of the things you quite often see when you're preparing chilies is people advising to de-seed them because it will make them less hot. And then there's a kind of commentary that always accompanies that, which is people say the seeds aren't hot, it's just the membrane that surrounds the seed that's hot. The seeds themselves don't have any heat. Today, we're just going to test that, kind of empirically. So I've got two different sorts of chilies here. I couldn't get scotch bonnets today, they just don't seem to be available at the moment. I've got some bird eye chilies, they're kind of a medium hot chilli, and I've got some red chilies which are slightly not so hot as bird chilies. So I haven't got anything really, really fiery here. I have got milk on standby in case it turns out to be hotter than I thought. But what we're going to do today is open these up, separate the seeds, the pith and the flesh, and then I'm going to do a taste test to see if there is any fire in the seeds on their own. So we'll start off with the mild ones and just open those up. Not an awful lot of seeds in there, but so people are saying that it's this bit here that's got the fire and it's not the seeds. 
So we'll just tap those seeds into there. And then I'm going to cut. Obviously, there is a bit of a contamination risk here that something will adhere to the knife. A little bit of capsaicin will adhere to the knife. I'm not going to be too rigorous about that because that kind of rigor wouldn't happen in the kitchen anyway. So what we're going to do is take a piece of the flesh there, which has got no pith attached. I've got a piece of the pith there with no seeds. We'll have no seeds on that. And then we've got the seeds themselves. So I guess the thing to do is to taste the bit that's supposed to be mildest first. So we're just going to taste the seeds on their own. So I've got one, two, three, uh, probably about 10 of the seeds there. And I'm just going to eat them. Well, there's definitely a little bit of heat there. Moderate heat, I would say. So there is some heat to the seeds. I suspect what this is, is that inside the seed there's no capsaicin, but there probably is on the outside, just by virtue of it being inside the chili there. So I think to say that the seeds aren't hot is probably false. The seeds are hot, I've just tasted them, they taste hot, and those are just seeds. If we get down to the point of, oh, it's not the seeds that are hot, it's something on the seeds, well, same difference as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, so now I'm going to taste a bit of the flesh on its own. So a little bit of the flesh of the red chilli there. Hotter than the seeds. Definitely hotter than that, than that little spoonful of seeds was. Okay. Just gonna wait a few seconds to let my palate kind of reset. I'm reluctant to actually just use the milk to try to reset my palate in case that skews the results. Okay, and now we're gonna try this little bit of pith here. This is the internal pith to which the seeds were attached. Yep, yep, that is hottest. That's the hottest part of the three. Now, need to need to probably allow for the fact that this could have been an incremental thing here. So the seed, I ate the seeds, the flesh, then the pith. And there could have been an incremental effect here. But I don't think so. This is a fairly mild chilli and my sensation of heat is actually subsiding more, almost down to zero in between these tastings. So confirmed, I guess, that the pith is the hottest bit, but it's false that the seeds have no heat. It's not true to say that the seeds have no heat. Now, of course, when it comes down to preparation of food, it's a moot point whether the seeds or the pith are hot, because when you're deseeding a chili, if you're deseeding it to reduce the heat, you will tend to just scrape the entire internal contents of the chili out. So deseeding means deseeding and removing the pith in general terms. Anyway, let's try the same thing with the bird eye chili. So we'll just take one of those and spice it down the middle. And here we've got a lot more seeds and a fair bit more of the pith as well. So, oops, made a mess of that. Let's do this one. So when people deseed, that's what they're talking about doing. So they're scraping out the pith and the seeds together. And so, yeah, it is a bit of a moot point, I think, really. So there we go, we got some of the seeds there. They have got some of the juice from the pith on them. So what I'm gonna do, just to try and make this as fair as possible, is I'll try and tap out some of those seeds into there. So we've got the seeds on their own. Some of them don't look great, actually. So I'm gonna just separate out a couple that don't look too special. And then, yeah, see, I've got little bits of pith attached, but again, that's the, that's the definition of seeds, really, isn't it, in this context, is that they are going to have little bits of whatever's attached to them. Let's try and do this as fairly as possible. So I will cut another one, and we'll try and get the seeds out completely intact. Need to try and kind of shake them out. 
Okay, I think that's as close as I'm going to get to clean seeds this time around. So there we go. So we've got 10 or so of the bird eye chili seeds. Let's taste them. <clears throat> hot. Okay, that's hot. Those seeds, <clears throat> those seeds are undeniably hot. Okay, <clears throat> gonna this is a slightly hotter chili, so it's gonna take a little while for my palate to reset. I'm, I am using the milk to reset, otherwise we're gonna be filming all day. It's quite interesting how different forms of chili have a different kind of burn. This was very much a burn on the tip of the tongue which is not my favorite chili heat, I've got to say. And it's not just about where you chew the thing, it's about different varieties of capsaicin have different effects on your nerve endings. Anyway, bit of the flesh now for the bird eye chili. Okay, that's hot, but not as hot as the seeds were. And then we've got to try and find a piece of the pith here, which is not going to be quite so easy, I don't think, for this, because it's just such a small fruit. Let's see if we can get it out of that bit there. Okay. And then we've just got to take off the seeds. So we don't confound the results. Okay, now we've got a piece of the pith from the bird eye chili. Let's give that a taste. Oh yeah, that's hottest. That's the hottest part, definitely. Wow. Yeah, that's the hottest part. <clears throat> that's, done <laughs> that's actually made my scalp itch. I'm going to go for the milk here. I'm not. I'm. Un, I'm a bit of a lightweight when it comes to chilies. I've got to say, I would not attempt this with a Carolina Reaper. <clears throat> okay. So, what do we learn here? Firstly, it is true that the pith is the hottest part of the chili. In these two experiments, the the pith is definitely the hot part of the chili. However, it is not true that the seeds are not hot. The seeds definitely have some heat. In the bird eye chili, the seeds are hotter than the flesh. In the standard red chili, the seeds are not so hot as the flesh. So, interesting results. I imagine probably if I washed and scrubbed these seeds, you might find all of the heat disappears from them. But I just don't think that's relevant, really. The point is that if you take the seeds out of a chili, you are taking some of the heat out of the chili. And certainly in the case of the bird eye chili, you're taking away a hotter part of the chili than the flesh. But again, when you de-seed a chili, you're scraping the whole lot out anyway, typically. So it is a moot point, but it's also false information to say that the seeds are not hot. These chilies are not gonna to go to waste. They're going to go into my MOU sandwich, which I will be making today. And you may already have seen that video by the time this is published. But yeah, I'm not gonna waste these chilies. It's the start of March and it's time to taste my odds and ends pickle. And we've got a lovely spring day. We're out here in the garden surrounded by crocuses and daffodils. It's actually warm enough for short sleeves. And yeah, I'm gonna try my odds and ends pickle. So I've got some lovely cheese, some crackers, a bit of salad and fruit, and we're just gonna get stuck in. I'm having with this a beer called Devon Dumpling Golden Ale. Oh, that's really nice. Mm. Okay, now for cheese, we've got Shropshire Blue, Snowdonia Red Storm, which is a vintage red Leicester, and this one's called Twanger, which is a mature cheddar.
What's this? That's vintage red Leicester. Ooh. Right, and now, there we go. Okay, this was made from leftover vegetables that we had from our veg box. Get down, your mum's chair. Eva. And that's what we've ended up with. So it's this mix of cooked pickled vegetables. That's a good wedge of that one there. Do you want to try a bit of that, Jenny? Okay, right, without further ado, we're going to get some of this, get a bit of this cheese and try some of this odds and ends pickle on it. Nice generous wodge of it on there. There we go. Let's give that a taste. Mm. That's good. I'm glad I put the curry powder in it actually. That's a, that's a nice little edge it's got on there from that. Mm. That's a really tasty chutney. I'm really happy with that. Thoughts? Mm. Yeah? Yeah, it's nice. Let's try it with a bit of this red Leicester now. Super happy with that and considering the amount of spice that went in there, it's actually quite a mild and sweet tasting pickle. Because those vegetables absorb a lot of the spice flavour. And so when you make these chutneys, you almost have to go overboard with the spices because if you don't, you end up with something that's, that's just a bit wishy-washy. But while it's maturing, the vegetables and fruits and sugar mitigate those spices and round them out. And you end up with something that's just, well, really well-rounded flavour. So just for comparison, this is a curried peach pickle that I was given for Christmas. And this is more like a mango chutney, I suppose. It looks a bit more like mango chutney, doesn't it? So let's just give that a taste comparison. Hmm. That's really nice. It's sweeter and slightly more tangy, but also a simpler flavour than what I've made here. So I'm calling that a huge success. Really pleased with that. And I've got, I think, five or six more jars, including a really big one, which we'll save for Christmas this year. And let that mature for a full, well, nearly a full year. And see how that goes. So I hope that was interesting. That was my odds and ends pickle. I'm going to get on with my lunch now and turn the camera off. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.